Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy Angel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. And even though you dispute the fact, you are dead. And so the very fact that you think that you are not dead is another proof that you are. You have no sensibility even to the fact that you are spiritually without life. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they delivered today. We're listening to a sermon by Arthur T. Pearson, who was preached in London in 1892 at Metropolitan Tabernacle. Now that that church may ring a bell, we're going to get into it. All right, Joel, first I just wanted to say a little thank you from Todd, who sent us an email. He said, hey guys, thanks again for all you do. It's really superb to see you all doing this week by week, month by month, with new content, new fervor, and great approaches. Thank you, Todd, for the email. Very encouraging. And yeah, we do appreciate that. Uh, week to week, we're producing new stuff. Thank you for noticing. It's always fun to do it. But there are definitely some times where I'm like, man, I got a lot not a lot on the docket. I'm a little tired, but I get back in there and keep at it. So I'm glad that it is appreciated by those of you who are listening. This episode is on Arthur T. Pearson. Uh, he is honestly a really famous uh, guy. That is, it's one of those guys where it's like, I probably, probably should have gotten to him by now. Uh, but some, when you're covering all these sermons, all these different people, um, sometimes it's just hard to get them in there. And then there might be a lot of you listening and going, I have never heard of this guy. And that's also okay if you haven't, but he's got a very cool life and he's really influenced a lot of different organizations and things that came before him. What's also really interesting about him. I've never really, I don't really see much of this is he kind of changed his theology and some of his beliefs later in life, uh, which was something that really stood out to me. Usually when someone is, you know, slanted in one direction, they're you know, and not in a bad way. Like sometimes we'll see them become, you know, maybe more loose in their theology or they'll give up the Bible. Uh, But one thing I appreciated about reading about his story was he actually seemed to keep getting more firm and more solid and stuff that he was believing as he got older, which was really unique. So I really like this guy. Um, And his passion for missions was out of this world. And I think you'll see that in just this life that he lived. Yeah, he was he was born and raised in America, in New York. He was born in 1837. At the age of 13, he was going to a revival, and uh, you know, revival was kind of sweeping through the nation at that time. He surrendered his life, became a believer uh, at a revival service that was going on. Uh, he quickly, you know, decided he's going to go to school, going to go to seminary. And around 1860, he graduated from uh, seminary and got married to his wife, Sarah. Together with his wife, Sarah, they had seven children, all of which uh, seems to have gone and served the Lord uh, themselves as as missionaries, which is really neat. You can definitely see that the Lord was working in their family. He was a uh, a rising star in New York and in the Detroit area where actually ended up uh, having the largest church in Detroit. But the next part of the story takes a little bit of an unexpected turn. In 1876, his church, this large up and coming big church burns down. And this is not the first time we've talked about a church or an incident with fire. Charles Spurgeon actually very similarly around the same time had his own incident with somebody yelling fire in a crowded place. And now the thing about D.L. Moody also had Mm. his church burnt down, I think only a couple years before this. So this was just an era uh, for fires, I guess, and being a problem with the churches of the time, you know, because you don't really, you wouldn't hear that being a story today. It would be big news of one of the biggest, you know, churches in a city burnt down, but we don't don't see it as much. The 1800s were, I mean, your biggest enemy was uh, was fires. (laughs) Again, or it was God's way of choosing you out, that you're going to be one of the big ones because it seems like something they experienced. Uh, so after the fire, his, his, there's kind of some revivals happening in the area and Pearson's going to them kind of lost and not sure what to do. And he repented. Repented of what? Well, he realized he had become focused on having a big, wealthy, extravagant church and being a famous man that powerful people, smart people really looked up to in the Detroit scene. And he realized that had become more important to him. And when that fire took it away, he re- he he re- he realized what he had really been pursuing wasn't God, but was that. He started focusing on evangelization and reaching the lost. He moved his church to a local opera house. They would share it on the Sundays uh, and really made it about doing missions work to the poor. He got rid of pew rentals. Back then, if you wanted a 
pew in a lot of churches, you would rent it and that would be your pew and you would pay the money, the church would take the money and they would save that pew for you. And he said, you know what, I don't think that's biblical. We're not doing that anymore. We're not funding the church with pew rentals. And he said, no more. That's, this is making me greedy. Uh, he said, I don't want to be greedy anymore. I'm going to work on faith salary, which he said meant I'm just going to show up and work and I'm going to trust God to provide my family and myself the money somehow. And I'm not going to ask where it comes from or anything like that. It's going to have to come from people. He did this work and trusted God and it worked out for him. Now, this might have been inspired by another man at the time, George Mueller, uh, who was running a huge orphanage in Britain. We've done several episodes on him. And one of them was not that long ago called Trust in the Lord. And it could have also been inspired by Hudson Taylor and his work with Faith Missions, which was also going on at the time. Either way, in 1885, D.L. Moody was having a conference on missions and invited Pearson. And Pearson promoted a new idea. He kind of announced a plan. Let's reach the entire globe in this next generation. And he wrote a book called The Crisis of Missions, explaining the need for missionaries to go around the world. And it was published the next year. It inspired a huge list of famous notables, even some people that have ended up on Elisa's show, Martyrs and Missionaries, to go out and spread the gospel. In 1886, he was preaching this need for missions to a group at the YMCA, and he called for volunteers. He said, we're going to do it. We're going to reach the world in this generation. Who's going to go? And 100 people volunteered at the time. This created what would be called the Student Volunteer Movement, an organization that encouraged students to, hey, go overseas for God while you're young. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, so this is late 1800s now. 1891 was when he first went to England on this tour to encourage missionaries uh, to preach the gospel around the world, right? So kind of uh, inner inner global travel is semi becoming more realistic now. You got decent steam engines, uh, decent ocean liners that are, that are coming about. Um, while he was actually in England, Charles Spurgeon died while he was there, and he was asked to fill the pulpit while the church worked on finding a suitable replacement at Metropolitan Tabernacle. His replacement would eventually become Thomas Spurgeon, his son, but for two years, Pearson was behind the pulpit and, and kind of holding things together in the meantime. And at that time, Pearson, uh, he wasn't even baptized because he was Presbyterian. He came from a Presbyterian background, but while he was teaching there, and this is neat, he... he became convicted and convinced that he should be baptized himself as an adult there at Metropolitan. So in 1896, he wished to be baptized, and uh, James Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon's brother, would end up baptizing him. That would have been a neat event to be in, to, to, to be in that room and to see that all go to, and that would have been really neat. And uh, Arthur Pearson took a lot of heat from it. The, the Presbyterian Church actually excommunicated him because of that, and I don't know, it's, it, he has an interesting view on it because he continued to worship. He still considered himself a Presbyterian, so I guess he didn't let it affect him too much. Uh, I would have been curious to ask him questions about his view on the Presbyterian Church and, and his involvement with that. Yeah, it seemed to me like he was like, I, I love Presbyterian the movement. I love what we're doing. I understand they had to excommunicate me because I disagree with them on this subject now, um, but I'm still with them in heart. Yeah, it's kind of how I, I kind of how I viewed. It. I didn't get to do all the research, so there might be some screed out there where he says differently, but that's not the vibe I got. Um, and it seemed like he just kind of was like, "Hey, I think we're, I think the Presbyterian movement still where my heart is, but we got this one thing wrong." Hmm. Um, seemed to be the and and you know you might be listening and go, "I completely disagree with Pearson." That's that's okay, right? Uh, it was just interesting to see him kind of move. Uh, and that wasn't the only area he moved. He also was an advocate against theological liberalism. And I don't know that he started out with this firm passion, but over time, he just saw the waves of attacks that were on the church. He probably saw the effect it had on Charles Spurgeon. We've done an episode on the downgrade controversy with Charles Spurgeon before. And just seeing all this theological, philosophical attacks really uh, burned him up. And so he started to join the fundamentalists, helped contribute to a magazine called The Fundamentals that would help publish attacks and like defenses of the faith during that time. Uh, there were so many more things he was involved in too. We're, we're barely scratching the surface. He helped write the biography of George Mueller. Uh, he helped set up the Oriental Mission Society and the African Inland Mission. Uh, at the end of his life, he himself would get to go over and he would get to do a preaching tour in East Asia. However, very shortly after arriving, he got very sick with the illness that would claim his life. 
but he had such a heart for missions that in his will, he wished like his final wish was that there would be a Bible college in Korea. And that uh, did get created. And not long after it still stands to this day, it's had its name changed over the years. Uh, now it's Pyeongtaek. Pyeongtaek. Perfect. I, I think I'm probably saying Perfect that wrong. Perfect enunciation. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, but it's Pyeongtaek University. It's still operating this day. I'm not, I couldn't tell. I don't. I don't think it's still a Bible college. It might still be though. Now listen to this great man. He inspired so many others, and this was his sermon on what the heart of the gospel is. There is one text in the New Testament that has been preached from oftener than any other in the Bible. It has been the foundation of great revivals of religion, like that among the Tahitians or that among the Telugus in India, where 2,222 people were baptized in one day, nearly 5,000 people in 30 days, and 10,000 people within 10 months, and where, even during the year drawing to its close, nearly 10,000 more souls have been baptized. It is a wonderful text. Luther called it one of the little gospels. It is this, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You will naturally wonder what there is in that old text that is new. I have found something that was very new to me and which also may be to you. I suppose that I had read that verse tens of thousands of times, and yet a little while ago, as I was led to preach upon that text, I sought of the Lord a clear view of it, that I might glorify him by bringing out of his treasure things old and new. After reading these familiar words over perhaps a hundred times, prayerfully asking for new light and insight, there suddenly came to me this absolutely new discovery as though one looking up into the heavens should see a cloud swept away from before the stars and a new constellation revealed. It flashed on my mind that there are ten words in the verse that are quite prominent words, such as God, loved, world, whosoever, and so on. Then a little more close and careful search showed these words in an undiscovered mutual relation. The ten words were in five pairs. There is one pair of words that has to do with the two persons of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son. There is a second pair of words that has to do with the expression of the Father's attitude or posture towards this world. He loved and he gave. Then there is a third pair of words that refers to the objects of the divine love, world and whosoever. And then there is a fourth pair of words that shows us what the attitude of man ought to be when God's love and gift comes to his knowledge believe, and have. Then the last pair of words points us to the extremes of human destiny, the result of rejection and the result of acceptance, perish, and life. Often as I had read this gospel in a sentence, I had never seen before that close relationship between the main words in the sentence, and as far as I know, nobody else has mentioned it before. For it's one of the beautiful privileges about the study of the precious word of God that the humblest believer who asks the grace of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in studying the Holy Scriptures may make a discovery for himself. Let us look at this text in the light of this fresh arrangement of the thoughts which it contains. To my mind, it's one of the most remarkable discoveries that has ever been permitted me to make in the study and exploration of the hidden treasures of the Word of God. In the first place, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There are two of the persons of the Godhead. Many are troubled about the relation of the Father to the Son and of the Son to the Father. They cannot exactly see how Jesus Christ can be equal with God if he is God's Son, and they cannot see how he can be as glorious as the Father and how he can be entitled to the same honor and homage and worship as the Father if he proceeds from the Father and comes into the world. But let us seek a simple illustration. It is said in the introduction of this gospel according to John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. What is a word? It's the expression of a thought that lies in the mind. The thought is not visible, the thought is not audible. But when it takes the form of a spoken word, or a written word, that thought that was invisible in the mind, that you could not see or hear or know about in any other way, 
comes to your eye on the printed page or to your ear through the voice of the speaker. And so my invisible thoughts are coming to you now through these audible words. The word is so connected with the thought that it is the expression of the thought. The thought is the word invisible. The word is the thought visible. Now Jesus Christ was the invisible thought of God put into a form in which you could see it and hear it. And just as the word and the thought are so connected that if you understand the word, you understand the thought, and if you understand the thought, you understand the word, just so the word would have no meaning without the thought, and the thought no expression without the word. So Jesus Christ helps us to understand the Father, and the Father could not make himself perfectly known to us except through the Son. But again we are told that Christ is the light of the world, John 8:12. Suppose I should say, in the beginning was the light, and the light was with the sun, and the light was the sun. The sun sends the light, and the light proceeds from the sun. Yet the light and the sun are the same in nature and the same in essence, and the glory of the sun is the glory of the light, and the glory of the light is the glory of the sun. And although the light goes from the sun, it is equal with the sun, shares the same glory, and is entitled to the same valuation. We cannot think of one without the other. In this part, not a word is said about the love of the Son for sinners, nor a word about the Son's offering of himself for the salvation of men. What is a common, old-fashioned notion that we sometimes find cropping up even in the conceptions of Christian people as well as unbelievers these days? Many think of the Father as representing justice and of the Son as representing mercy. They imagine the Son as coming between the wrath of the Father and the guilty sinner. We think of it like the story of Pocahontas, who was the daughter of an Indian chief who came between the executioner and Captain Smith. She did this when the executioner was standing with his club up high, ready to strike the fatal blow on the head of his victim, but she stood in the way. The notion of a great many people is that God the Father is all wrath, and that we can never look at God or think of God and that God never can look at us or think of us, except with a kind of mutual abhorrence and antagonism. And so Jesus Christ incarnates the principle of love and comes in between the angry God and the sinner. That's a very shallow notion indeed. Have you never gotten a hold of the idea that the Father is just as much interested in you as the Son is, and that the Father loves you just as much as the Son does? Look at this verse. It puts all the glory of the love and the sacrifice upon the Father. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He puts it so that you and I may understand that our notion of the Son is our notion of the Father. When Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us, Jesus answered, Have I been so long with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how can you say then, show us the Father? John 14, 8 through 9. Don't you understand my thoughts if you understand my words? And if my word is the right expression of my thought, how absurd would it be for someone to say, I understand his words well enough, but I wish that I could understand his thoughts. My word, being a human, may not always properly express my thoughts, but with God, the word is the perfect expression of the thought. And so if you have understand the word, you have understood the thought. And if you've understood the thought, you have understood the word. If you've seen the Son, you have seen the Father. If the love of the Son has touched you, the love of the Father has touched you. If you worship the Son, you worship the Father. If you obey the Son, you obey the Father. So that you do not need to be troubled about your feelings toward the Father, and say, as many a person has said to me, I wish that I could feel toward the Father as I feel toward Jesus. I wish that I could have those views of God the Father that I have of Jesus. I wish that I could have the freedom with the Father that I have with the Son. Now dismiss all that kind of trouble and complexity from your mind. For as you think of the Son, you think of the Father. And as you love the Son, you love the Father. As you pray to the Son, you pray to the Father. And as you obey and serve the Son, you obey and serve the Father. The Son thinks of you just as the Father does. And the Father thinks of you just as the Son does. Near so very near to God, nearer I cannot be, for in the person of his Son I am as near as he. So dear, so very dear to God, dearer I cannot be, for the love which he loves the Son 
is the love he bears to me. The second pair of words is loved and gave. He loved and gave. I have no desire to enter into nice distinctions, but with the simplicity of a little child approach this heart of the gospel. And yet, a child will understand that when we use the word love, we sometimes mean one thing and sometimes another. For instance, suppose that you should try to get some poor criminal out of a prison, a miserable, filthy, degraded, defiled man. Somebody asks you why you do it, and you say that you love him. Now, that would not be taken to mean the same kind of love as you bear your mother. Those are very different loves. The love that you bear to your mother and the love you bear to some vile criminal. The word love has a different meaning in different cases. The Apostle John says, We love him because he first loved us. John 4.19 Was not the love of God to us something different from the love that we bear to him? I love God because I know him to be the most beautiful, the most wise, the most glorious, the most fatherly, the most tender, the most pitiful, and the most gracious being in the universe. Why did he love me? Because he saw that I was beautiful and truthful and lovely and honest and honorable? Not so, says the apostle, but God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 So, there are two kinds of love. We call them the love of complacence and the love of benevolence. Complacence means a feeling of pleasure. You love a beautiful person, a lovely character, because you see something in the person and in the character that draws out your love. But that's not the kind of love that we call the love of benevolence. For such a love is bestowed on people in whom we do not see anything beautiful or lovely. We love them for the sake of the good that we may do them, or for the sake of the beautiful character that, by grace, we may help to develop in them. So therefore, the love of complacence is inward, but the love of benevolence is outward. The love of complacency is partial, the love of benevolence is impartial. The love of complacency is exclusive and select, the love of benevolence is inclusive and universal. The love of complacency is a kind of selfish love, but the love of benevolence is a generous love. The love of complacency may be an involuntary love. We see the qualities that attract affection, and we love unconsciously and involuntarily. But the love of benevolence is voluntarily exercised. The love of complacency has to do with comparatively few of the people whom we know. The love of benevolence takes in the whole world, and hundreds and thousands of people whom we do not know and never saw but whom, for the sake of Jesus, we love. Have you fixed that in your thought? The kind of love, then, that God had for us was the love of benevolence, outward, inclusive, impartial, universal, self-denying, self-forgetting, voluntary. Now, it is the characteristic of that kind of love that it gives. We call it the love of benevolence, and benevolence is another word for giving. And such love keeps nothing but gives everything that it has and gives to everybody. Of course, if God loved us after that sort, he had to give. He could not love if he did not give any more than the sun could be the sun without shining, or a spring of water could be a spring without flowing out into a stream. And so these words, loved and gave, naturally go together. You could not have the one without the other. There could not be this wonderful giving without this wonderful loving, And there could not be this wonderful loving without this wonderful giving. Now let's look at the third pair of words, world and whosoever. It does not need to be said that both are universal terms. World is the most universal term that we have in the language. For instance, we sometimes mean it by the whole earth on which we dwell, sometimes the whole human family that dwells on the earth, and sometimes the world age, or whole period during which the whole family of man occupies the sphere. That is the word that God uses to indicate the objects of his love. But there's always the danger of our losing sight of ourselves in a multitude of people. In the great mass, individuals are lost, and it becomes to us simply a countless mass. But when God looks at us, he never forgets each individual. Each one of you stands out just as plainly before the Lord as though you were the only man, woman, or child on earth. So God adds here another word, whosoever, which is also universal, but with this difference between the two. 
world is collectively universal. That is, it takes all men in the lump. Whosoever is distributively universal. That is, it takes everyone out of the mass and holds him up separately before the Lord. If this precious text only said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, one might say, oh, he never thought of me. He had a kind of general love for the whole world, but he never thought of me. But when God uses that all-embracing word, whosoever, that must mean you and me. For whatever my name or yours may be, our name is whosoever, is it not? John Newton used to say that it is a great deal better for him that this verse had the word whosoever in it than the name John Newton in it. For, he said, if I read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that when John Newton believed he should have everlasting life, I should say, perhaps there is some other John Newton out there. But whosoever means this John Newton and the other John Newton and everybody else, whatever their name may be. Blessed be the Lord, he would not have us forget that he thought of each one of us, and so said, whosoever. You notice the same thing in the Great Commission. Go you into all the world, collectively universal, and preach the gospel to every creature, distributively universal, Mark 16, 15. Before I leave this pair of words, let me illustrate what a precious term this word whosoever is. It reminds me of the great doors of the tabernacle that spring open to let in poor souls that want to hear the gospel. This word whosoever is the wide gate to salvation and lets in any poor sinner who seeks to find for himself a suffering but reigning savior. In the South Seas, in the beginning of the present century, was a man by the name of Hunt who had gone to preach the gospel to the inhabitants of Tahiti. The missionaries had labored there for about 14 or 15 years, but had not at that point made a single convert. Desolating wars were then spreading across the island of Tahiti and the neighboring islands. The most awful idolatry, sensuality, ignorance, and brutality with everything else that was horrible prevailed. And the word of God seemed to have made no impression upon those sinful islanders. A translation of the gospel according to John had just been completed, and Mr. Hunt, before it was printed, read from the manuscript translation, the third chapter, and as he read on, he reached the sixteenth verse, and in the Tahitian language gave those poor idolaters this compact little gospel. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A chief stepped out from the rest, his name was Pomer II, and said, Would you read that again, Mr. Hunt? Mr. Hunt read it again. Would you read that once more? And he read it once more. Ah, said the man, that may be true of you white folks, but it is not true of us down here in these islands. The gods have no such love as that for us. Mr. Hunt stopped in his reading, and he took that one word, whosoever, and by it showed that poor chief that God's gospel message meant him, that it could not mean one man or woman any more than any other. Mr. Hunt was expounding this wonderful truth when Pamir II said, Well then, if that is the case, your book will be my book, and your God will be my God, and your people will be my people, and your heaven will be my home. We down in the island of Tahiti never heard of any God that loved us and loved anybody in that way. And that first convert is now the leader of a host, numbering nearly a million in the South Seas. Reference has already been made to the fact that this was the great text that Dr. Clough found so blessed among the Telugus. When the Great Famine came on in 1877, and the missionaries were trying to distribute relief among the people, Dr. Clough, who was a civil engineer, took a contract to complete the Buckingham Canal. And he got the famishing people to come in gangs of 4,000 or 5,000, and then after the day's work was over, he would tell them the simple story of redemption. He had not yet learned the Telugu language sufficiently to make himself well understood in it, but he had done this. He committed to memorizing John 3.16 in the Telugu tongue, and when in talking to his people he got stuck, he would fall back on John 3.16. What a blessed thing to be able at least to repeat that. Then he would add other verses, day by day, to his little store of committed texts, until he had a sermon, about half an hour long, composed of a string of texts like precious pearls. 
I've sometimes thought I would rather have heard that than many modern sermons. So once again, the great text that God used to bring souls to Christ was still Luther's little gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we come to the fourth pair of words, believe and have. You will see how important these words are. If God so loved that he gave, what is necessary on the part of man? Only this, that he should take and have. That's very plain. If God loved you and the whole world and gave you all that he had to give, all that remains for anybody to do is to appreciate the love of God as to take the gift that God bestows and to have the gift that he takes. Believing is receiving. John at the beginning of this gospel tells us in what sense he's going to use the word believe. That word occurs 45 times in the gospel according to John, which is the great gospel of believing. You do not find the word repent in it once, but it is constantly repeating, believing, 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 and having life. In the 12th and 13th verses of the first chapter we read, To as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1.12 To as many as received, even to those who believe. That little word even indicates that to believe is equivalent to receive. You may, in any one of those 44 instances in this gospel, put the word receive in the place of the word believe and still make good sense of it. For example, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever received him might have everlasting life. You have what you take, don't you? It's a very simple thing to take what is given to you and so to have it. That is practically all there is in faith. We may make faith obscure by talking too much about it, leading others to infer that there is some obscurity or mystery. Faith is very simple. It's taking the eternal life that is offered to you in Christ. If you can put forth your hand and receive a gift, you're able to put forth your will and receive the gift of God, even Jesus Christ, as your Savior. I heard an old lady who was starting on a railway journey from an American station, out of which many trains move, although in different directions. Not having traveled much on the rail cars, she got confused. The old lady I speak to was going to Bay City, Michigan, and she was afraid that she was, perhaps, on the wrong train. She reached over and showed her ticket to somebody in the seat immediately in front of her and said, I want to go to Bay City. Is this the right train? Yes, madam. Still, she was not quite at ease, for she thought that perhaps this fellow passenger might have gotten into the wrong train too. So, she stepped across the aisle of the car and showed her ticket to another person, and was again told, Yes, madam, this is the right train. But still the old lady was a little uncertain. In a few moments came the conductor, or as you call him, the guard, and she saw on his cap the conductor's ribbon, and she beckoned to him and said, I want to go to Bay City. Is this the right train? Yes, madam, this is the right train. And now she settled back in her seat and was asleep before the train moved. That illustrates the simplicity of taking God at his word. She did nothing but just receive the testimony of that conductor. That's all. But that is faith. The Lord Jesus says to you, I love you. I died for you. Do you believe? Will you receive the salvation that I bought for you with my own blood? You don't need to do any work, not even so much as get up and turn around. You do not need to go and ask your fellow man across the church aisle there whether he has believed and received and been saved. All that you need to do is with all your heart say, Dear Lord, I do take this salvation that you have bought for me and brought to me. Simple, is it not? Yes, very simple. Yet, such receiving is the soul of faith. And what is assurance but consciously having what you take? Somebody comes and offers me tonight some free will offering. It costs me nothing. All that I have to do is take what is given to me and have it for my own. Faith is the taking, and the assurance is the conscious having, and that's all that I know about it. There remains another pair of words. Would to God that I might impress the meaning of those terms, perish and everlasting life. What does perish mean and what does life mean? When the prodigal son went into the far country and had wasted his substance in riotous living, he came to himself 
and came back to the Father and said, Father, I have sinned, Luke 15, 21. And the Father said, This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, Luke 15, 24. A son that is lost to his father is dead to his father, and a son that is found by his father is alive to his father. God said to Adam, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you surely die. Genesis 2.17 It did not mean that Adam should that day die physically. It meant something worse than that. He died to God when he ate it. One proof that he died to God when he ate that forbidden fruit is that when God came down to walk in the garden as the companion of Adam in the cool of the day, our first parents shrank from the presence of the Lord and hid behind the trees of the garden when they heard his voice and the sound of his voice. They were dead to sympathy towards God, dead to love towards God, dead to pleasure in God, and so they tried to get out of the way of God as if it were possible to put a veil between them and him. How do you know you are dead to God? You want to get out of his way. You do not love the things that God loves. You'd like to be independent of God's rule. You would like, if possible, to get into some corner of the universe where there is no God. You're like the men in America who went across to California when the golden gates of that country were first opened, that they might enrich themselves. They tried to do without God, and there was a horrible state of sensuality and criminality there. And though there were nominally Christian families and even Christian churches, these gold seekers had left God on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, if not still further off on the other side of the Appalachian. They wanted to get where there was no sanctuary, Bible or family altar, and no restraint of Christian government or recognition of a God above. The psalmist twice says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Psalm 14.1, Psalm 53.1 and if you leave out the italicized words, which are not in the original, it reads like this. The fool has said in his heart, no God. That is, I wish that there were no God. The impious man hates God. It's an uncomfortable thing for him to think that there is a sovereign of all the earth who will judge all the works done in the body. It's uncomfortable to think that beyond the grave there lies the great court of the judgment day, and that one is unprepared to go into that judgment and meet the judge. And so people try to make up their minds that there is no life after death or judgment, and that there is no God. It's a sign that you are dead when you would like that there should be no God, and you do not want God to have any rule over you. And what is the sign that you're alive? You come to yourself, and then you come to the Father? You would not have God out of the universe if by a stroke of the hand you could annihilate him. You would not have the judgment seat out of the universe for that is the place where all wrongs are made right. You would not have heaven blotted out, for that is where the quenched lamps of hope are all relit, and the golden links of love are reunited, and where there will be no more sin, nor sorrow, nor sighing, nor tears, and where every shadow will flee away. Paul says that the woman who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives, 1 Timothy 5, 6. That is to say, while she exists, she is so wrapped up in fashion, in ornaments, in the braiding of the hair and the putting on of gold and gorgeous apparel, living for this world and her own indulgence, that she is dead to the things that are alone worth living for, and that take hold of the invisible, divine, and eternal. Now, let us once more hear the word of the living God. God so loved you that he gave the best that he had to give and all that he had to give. And while he gave to the whole world, he singled you out as the object of his love and said, Whosoever, every creature. And now that the gift is given you and there is no more to be given, God can do no more. He does not ask you to pay the one thousandth part of a farling for the priceless values represented in the Son of God. All that God can do now is to say to you the very fact that you reject his dear Son is proof that you are spiritually dead. And even though you dispute the fact, you are dead. A deaf man may not understand how deaf he is, and a blind man may not understand the glories of sight, and so a dead man cannot understand the energies of the living. And so the very fact that you think that you are not dead is another proof that you are. You have no sensibility even to the fact that you are spiritually without life. God comes and says, Come back to me, my prodigal and wandering son. 
You will have the robe. You will have the ring. You will have the shoes. I will give them all to you with the absoluteness of an infinite love, and you will take them and have them because you take them. The very moment that you turn toward God and say, My Father, I take the robe and the ring and the shoes and the place of a restored son in the Father's house, you will live again. For you recognize your Father and yourself as his Son. You recognize his right to command and your duty to obey. You recognize that the only place for a son is the home and the heart of his father. And that is the proof that you are once more alive. Tell me how long it would take to change from death to life. Just as long and no longer as it takes you to turn around. Your back has been on God. You turn and your face is toward him. It will take no longer for a sinner to become a living son of God than that. Cast your whole will into the acceptance of the fatherhood of God. Renounce your sin and your rebellion, and take the salvation that is given to you as freely as the sun gives its light or the spring gives its string. And before you turn around to go out of that church door, you may have this salvation and perhaps enjoy in yourself the awareness that you are saved. For me, one part of this sermon that just stood out, I mean, for starters, this is a sermon on John 3, 16, which is funny to me because in the sermon, he kind of talks about how, you know, this is something everyone's talked about. And I think that's true. But I also do think uh, because John 3, 16 has been talked about so much, I actually wonder if people are not talking about it as much as they used to, because I'm trying to think back. I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon on John 3, 16, since I've been alive, I hear people talk about how it's such a famous verse. And, you know, you'll see it on the back of a football jersey or something, but I, I can't think of too many sermons. I have personally, in my you know background, have heard actually on this sermon alone, uh, on this verse alone. However, he mentioned this gentleman named Hunt that went to the islands of Tahiti. And I really love this story of just this guy translating and then getting this one verse to the people and the chief hearing it and going, Wait, you know, is that verse true? Is that is that the one? Is there? And then the the chief going, well, then if that's the case, your book will be my book, and your God will be my God, and your people will be my your my people. It just had this very much Ruth and Naomi vibe to it that was just really cool. And seeing how God used this one, uh, this one statement, this one verse to reach these people, I think sometimes we can easily overthink things and try to think of new ways to approach things. And I'm going to have this great theological insider. I'm going to go where people haven't gone before. I'm going to study this. And sometimes it's just really amazing to think of just the simple verse and the power of it to change people's lives. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Nathaniel Owen. Big thanks to Nathaniel Owen for narrating today's episode. If you enjoyed this episode of Revived Thoughts, we thank you for listening and we hope it will encourage you and encourage you to share this with other people. Let them know what we are doing here at Revived Thoughts. Also, tell people about martyrs and missionaries. Hearing Arthur T. Pearson and looking at the stories he told uh, really reminded me that we have not told anyone about our excellent mm. sister show, Martyrs and Missionaries, lately. Now, maybe that's partially because Martyrs and Missionaries, run by my wife, Elise, uh, it gets more downloads per episode than Revive Thoughts does, which is saying something because Revive Thoughts doesn't do half fat itself. Uh, but we do highly encourage you, if you want to hear amazing stories, go listen to Elise's show, Martyrs and Missionaries. There's something about hearing what these amazing people have done before us, these courageous, bold people for the gospel that I think deeply encourages uh, many of us in our faith today. And we hear it from you all the time, listeners telling us on Twitter and email or different places saying, hey, that really encouraged me. Thank you so much for putting it out. So if you're not listening to uh, Martyrs and Missionaries yet, we do really encourage you. Go check it out. Go listen. If you liked Arthur T. Pearson, you're going to love the people over on Martyrs and Missionaries. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts.